Hello and welcome to Your Right to a Wedding, Social Considerations Influencing World War II Bridal Attire by Dr. Ashley Hasty. Social dynamics influence and advise brides selecting wedding attire. In this case, bride magazine and etiquette books describe the ideal wedding apparel during the Second World War. Robertson defines social norms as shared values or guidelines that prescribe the behavior that is appropriate in a given situation. Norms define how people ought to behave under particular circumstances in a particular society. The etiquette books and magazines prescribed appropriate normative behavior by describing ideal weddings and wedding attire. These publications exercised a role of social control, ensuring adherence to expected and approved normative behavior by the members of the society. The specific social norm of concern is that of dressing up for one's wedding. Roach and Iker assert that, in many rituals of social life such as weddings, dressing up in garb and more finesse than that used in routine day-to-day -day existence is expected. This presentation addresses the nature of such expectations as defined through description by etiquette books and magazines. Emily Post published the 1937 edition of Etiquette, the Blue Book of Social Usage, with no reference concerning military weddings. The same generic passage about wedding apparel appears in all publications of the book from 1937 to 1945. It reads, it is always proper for a bride to wear a white dress and veil, no matter in what season of the year the wedding is held. It may be of any white material, satin, brocade, velvet, chiffon, or entirely of lace. It may be embroidered with pearls, crystals, or silver, or it may be as plain as a slip cover. It may be anything, in fact, that the bride fancies, and may be made in whatever fashion or period she chooses. By 1942, a wartime supplement was added as a final chapter. This portion of the book includes such subtitles as Remember Thoughtless Words and Danger Lives, The Perfect Hostess to Men in Uniform, A Girl Faces a Problem When a Man Goes to War, and, of course, Furlough Wedding Details. World War II caused some brides trouble concerning how to make a cohesive picture with men in the wedding party representing various branches of the military and having differing ranks. Post replied, you can't. She went on to say, the rule that the men of a bridal party shall be as precisely alike as a company of soldiers applies only to the civilian dress, since regardless of what they wear, the bridegroom chooses those of his best friends who are free to be with him at his wedding. The mixture of army and navy and civilian dress will certainly continue to be characteristic of many of the weddings for the duration of the war. The 1943 publication of Etiquette, the Blue Book of Social Usage, also includes a section following wartime supplements entitled Additions and Corrections, 1943. The section begins with a brief introduction explaining the change. Certain new rulings by Congress, as well as the new Army's dislike of impractical details of etiquette, suggest the need for these brief corrections and additions. The portion of interest for this presentation is entitled, Wedding Clothes of Waves and Wax, which explain the rules of formal apparel worn by these groups of women. When the war supplement was printed, no wave was permitted to wear evening or any other civilian clothes if more than three persons were present. This included brides or bridesmaids' dresses. The ruling now is that the waves may apply for permission from Washington to wear either brides or bridesmaids' dresses. But since this may require a month or longer, rushed wedding preparations mean no bridal attire. That the authorities of etiquette were conceding ground to the practicality precipitated by massive wartime mobilization evidences a changing social current that influenced wedding attire. It is noteworthy that the loosening of restriction on waves and wax coincided with the wedding attire exception in the L85 restrictions, evidencing government endorsement of traditional wedding attire. Post insisted that it was possible for a bride to have a beautiful wedding if she was able to create a bride-like appearance through white accessories such as a hat with a veil and a bouquet of flowers. Post further explained elaborate procedural rules regarding the type of dress worn, if a bride chose a dark, simple, tailored dress, she should not make a fuss over other wedding plans. It was best that this bride have a simple wedding with just a maid of honor and best man in attendance. However, if the bride made an effort to look particularly bridal, then more of the traditional customs may take place. 
These customs include walking down the aisle, some minimal decorations, the use of ushers, bridesmaids, and flower girls. Post also explained in some detail what was appropriate apparel for each member of the wedding party dependent upon what the bride chose to wear. By the 1945 publication of Etiquette, the Blue Book of Social Usage, the section entitled Wartime Supplements was no longer included. Instead, a new section was included entitled Military and Post-War Etiquette. The subsection, Today's Typical Wedding, described the importance of keeping war weddings simple. Preparations for the typical wedding of a man in the service are extremely simple, and invitations are often likely as not given to relatives and friends by word of mouth. That the business of war takes second place to none is a lesson learned from the earlier experiences of many brides' families who found themselves with elaborate preparations on their hands and hundreds of invitations to cancel at the last minute. Bride Magazine was published seasonally from 1940 to 1945, offering a more frequently updated glimpse at wedding traditions and trends during World War II as compared to etiquette books, which were typically published yearly. I collected over 100 pages with references to the war from Bride Magazine. About 80 pages were advertisements, about 25 were articles, and 11 pages were images of real weddings. A letter from the editor of Bride Magazine establishes the difference in approach of etiquette books when contrasted with magazines. Weddings, like everything else in wartime, become streamlined, changed, and tempered to fit the new and changing conditions. But one thing remains constant in this changing picture, the bride. By far the greatest majority of brides are real brides, picture brides in traditional wedding dresses and veils. These brides are fulfilling their own dreams of white weddings and granting their groom's wishes for a wedding to remember. Brides today are sharing trains and veils with other brides, ordering short trains and short veils in order to leave some satin and tool for others. 80% of the grooms are now in uniform. Their ushers may be civilians, officers, and privates in any branch of the service. These changing conditions make most hard and fast rules of wedding etiquette obsolete. The highest court of etiquette now says, do whatever you do with good sense and in good taste, and it will be correct. Bride Magazine gave us a better idea of changing wedding trends, new challenges faced by brides, and the effect the war had on weddings. Many advertisers, and we can only assume the brides as well, felt brides deserved, even had the right to the wedding of which they had always dreamed. A Lord & Taylor advertisement stated, War brides wanted to be beautiful too, and though time's short, they're having the gown and the wedding they've always dreamed of. The advertisements in Bride magazine give the reader an idea that times were different in the early 1940s. War was on everyone's mind and made planning a wedding quite challenging. Advertisements referred to the war in a variety of ways, including references to military wedding traditions, referring to L85 restrictions, mentioning the trend away from traditional white wedding gowns, and referring to time being an important factor in planning a furlough wedding. Many advertisements simply referred to the war through military wedding traditions. A straw bridge and clavier advertisement promotes the traditional ceremonial importance of walking under a silvery arch of cross swords, which is tacit advice to engage in these traditions when able. Through tying the store's heritage to this tradition, the store has effectively promoted both traditions mentioned. A Holmes department store advertisement refers to the arch of swords while referencing the furlough wedding and a variety of nationalistic ideas. This advertisement goes further in its association of traditional weddings and patriotism. The memories and dedications of a wedding ceremony are compared to that of dedication to one's country, all under the auspices of business with the Holmes department store. Many advertisements encouraged brides to have a traditional white wedding, some even stating that it was all the grooms wanted when they returned. The bride and groom deserved a wedding worth remembering. As mentioned previously, the L85 restrictions on clothing did not apply to wedding gowns. A New York Dress Institute advertisement used this fact to their advantage to encourage brides to spend money on their wedding dress. It reads, Your right to a wedding, one day above all others, is yours, a day so rare that it will live in vivid memory beyond the end of time. The date? 
who knows, today? Perhaps a telephone call will set the time, or maybe a telegram. And yet, that day is yours, just as though you'd planned it so. Mindful of your right to romance, your government has recognized the importance of preserving the traditional bridal gown. True to this trust, the ingenious bride makers of New York have created new wartime trains with all the illusion of that glorious sweep of white in the spirit of the fashions today. For you who must plan in haste, bridal shops the country over present a wide variety of traditional bridal gowns, ready to wear tomorrow. And when this war and its restrictions are long forgotten, the memory of your day will shine through all the years. An advertisement from Thalheimer Centurama also refers to the L85 restrictions, offering their services to help decipher and obey the laws. Service marriages. Do you confront the unforeseen puzzlers of a 1942 service wedding? Ask Thalheimers. We know all the answers, from how many inches the bridesmaid skirts may measure at the hem to where to seat the bridegroom's colonel and how to cut a cake with a sword. Thalheimer's bridal secretaries, plural please note, will plan any part or all of your wedding as you wish. They can get the true ivory satin that brides adore. They have planned colors to harmonize with army and navy uniforms where brides are marrying in street length dresses. Budgets have been worked out for everything from the short notice ceremony and a suitcase to the base to the grand slam wedding. Simply place yourself in Thalheimer's capable hands and emerge a happily married woman. Not all brides succumb to the desire to fulfill their dreams of a lavish traditional white wedding. A few advertisements catered to these brides with offers of wedding suits, practical wedding gown selections, and wedding services for the bride working in the military. The Bon Marche Seattle's Great Store advertisement pictures a woman in the military and the same woman in a wedding gown. It reads, Two lives I live, now, brave with the resolve to wear my uniform with dignity and pride, knowing that by so doing, the bells of peace will ring soon. Now, too, aglow with the dream of wedding bells. The shining glory of my wedding gown is equaled only but the radiance of our love. Through all the days of peace or war, the Bon Marche Bridal Bureau waits to guide all brides in the service or in civilian pace through all the wondrous maze of wedding planning. Although the Bon Marche advertisement still encouraged a white wedding, a Thalheimer's ad offered the non-traditional bride a more practical selection. The new wedding suit for the bride not being married in white, created in bride's blue wool by Fox Brownie for today's honeymoon, $98.95 bridal salon. Similarly, the Straw Bridge and Clavier ad encouraged a smart selection. Bridal Suite, the wartime bride waves the romantic in favor of the practical and looks her all-time smartest in a classic three-button suit of Palm Beach cloth. Cool, light, soft, cleanable, long-wearing, and wrinkle-resistant. In white, Alaska blue, yellow, or strawberry, sizes 12 to 20. In addition to the verbal references to the war, most advertisements had images of brides and soldiers as opposed to a groom in a suit. Some articles wrote specifically about what to wear to a wedding during a time of war. One article stated that for an informal hotel wedding, a short crepe dress and matching gloves in a misty blue color, a blue jersey dress with metallic thread, or a satin suit and matching headband were ideal. For a military post-wedding, a sapphire blue velvet suit or any wool suit in a shade of pale blue, lavender, beige, or green was best. In summary, Post included a generic passage about wedding apparel in her pre-war editions of her etiquette book. As the war became more ingrained in American culture and began to greatly influence society, she added the wartime supplement to discuss the challenges to weddings brought on by war. Despite the conservative and traditional nature of the etiquette books, they offered rich information about the challenges and tribulations faced by the bride planning her wedding during World War II. Bride Magazine offered a variety of glimpses inside the challenges a bride might face due to the ongoing war. Through advertisements and articles, challenges such as lack of resources and where to find a dress were addressed. Advertisers were eager to help the war bride plan her dream wedding that she and her soldier fiancé deserved. Thank you.